So, the question I want you to think about today is would you drink water from the Thames and why would you? Do you feel confident about drinking it? Would you drink it directly from the Thames? Would you drink it indirectly? Have a think about the questions we go through today's session. So today we are looking at water and we're looking at water pollution and we want to think about does all water have to be potable? Now potable might be a new term and it means the water is safe to drink. Okay, so it's different from pure water and you will look at this again in chemistry in year 11. But for today potable means safe to drink. So I'm hoping by the end of this video you should be able to give examples of how humans are affecting our water systems and you should also be able to explain the process of bioaccumulation and eutrophication. So we've got three probably new words that we're looking at in this video today, potable, bioaccumulation and eutrophication. We'll be using those words throughout the video and we'll go through those definitions a bit more too. So before we continue with the water pollution, I want to recap some of the work we did on air pollution in class. I want you to think about sulphur dioxide, which we know contributes to acid rain, and what impact that would have on plants. So if we were able to get into the lab, which we can't at the minute, we would possibly do experiments that you can see a picture of on the side, where we take some crest seedlings and we would grow an environment with raised sulphur dioxide levels and we'd do a comparison to see how well or not so well they would grow. So think about air pollution, what we learned previously. Which fuels release sulphur dioxide when they burn? How does sulphur dioxide in the air become acid rain? And then there's two fill in the blanks if you do. All rain is slightly acid at pH blank. Acid rain is even more acidic than that at pH blank. The low pH stops the in the plant cells from working properly. So pause the video, have a go at those questions before you look at the answers. So those answers then. Which fuels release sulphur dioxide when they burn? Fossil fuels. How does sulphur dioxide in the air become acid rain? The sulphur dioxide along with nitrogen oxide, which are released when burned from fossil fuels, rise into the atmosphere, they react with the water and oxygen in the clouds and they form an acidic solution which will fall as rain, sleet or snow. All rain is slightly acidic at a pH of about 6, but acid rain pH is more like 5. The low pH stops the enzymes in plant cells from working properly. So what I'd like you to do today is either print out or draw out a copy of this table and as we go through the next slides I want you to fill in information. So we've got some pollutants listed there, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, sewage and toxic chemicals. I want you to be able to write down some examples of the pollution caused by them, what is the source, and tell me about the effect on the environment. And we'll have a little quiz about some bonus information at the end. So, let's put into some context, why is water important? We are still having hundreds of people dying each day due to a lack of clean water, which you'd think in 2020 wouldn't be something that happens. We have approximately 1.2 billion people across the world who do not have access to clean water. And we need water for all sorts. We need it for drinking, but we need it for washing, we need it for growing food, transportation. And we've been talking about clean water a lot recently and how important it is to wash our hands. So having clean, safe water is essential to life. In terms of ourselves, well, we need to be drinking about a litre and a half, two litres of water every day. So that's about eight cups of water you hear quoted quite a lot. So, is water dangerous? Water doesn't have to look like this sewage plant here to be dangerous. We can have lots of microbes inside there. So we've got some nice diagrams of some parasitic worms there, some salmonella and norovirus. And if we think about when we have natural disasters, so if we think about earthquakes or hurricanes, what often is the thing that takes the most lives is due to diseases spread by unclean water after the event rather than the event itself. So the farming industry is a really important industry in this country and around the world. 
99% of us will be relying on the farming industry to provide us the food that we eat. Now the farmer needs to, or their, a lot of their aim is to grow as much crop as possible or get the highest yield possible in their land. And some of the things they'll do to improve their yield is use something called a fertiliser. So a fertiliser is basically a feed for the plants to make sure they've got all their vitamins and minerals so that plants can grow to their fullest. And sometimes if they are overused, the excess will be washed off the land and get into our water supplies and we have a process called eutrophication occur. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a few minutes. We also, if we think about we're fertilising the ground to help the crops we want to grow, we don't really want to be helping the weeds grow. And so a farmer might decide to use herbicides. And these are chemicals used to kill weeds or the herbs. Now, these chemicals can also be non-targeted. So they won't just kill, say, the dandelions. They'll kill all sorts of plants where they're applied. And this can lead to a reduction in biodiversity. So things like wildflowers, which may not be affecting the farmer's crop too much, can be damaged in the process. And then if we think about how important wildflowers are for bees and other pollinators, if they don't have a source of food, they're going to suffer too. So we get this knock-on effect and reduction of biodiversity. The other thing farmers might use and gardeners might use on their plants is a pesticide. And this is used to kill small creatures, pests. And again, we have the problem of things not being targeted. So most often it is one or two bugs which are causing serious issues, not the whole invertebrate population, but the pesticides will harm all the invertebrates in the area. So we get this reduction in biodiversity. A really famous example is one called DDT, which was very popular um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, it was the most powerful pesticide the world had created at the time and it led to a reduction in the American bald eagle population and this was um, famously kind of recorded in the book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson often quoted in lots of songs and, and the like. Now what happened was this DDT excess was getting into the food chain so it was going to the rivers, small creatures eat it, the fish would eat those small creatures, those fish were eaten by the American bald eagle. And by the time it got up to the American bald eagle, they were taking in a large amount of this DDT. And it meant that when they laid eggs, they would not reach maturity because they we had the thinning of the eggshell. And so we had a reduction in the population of American bald eagles. So this led to a change in policies. But we still have debates going on now about what pesticides, herbicides should be allowed to use and, and whether we should or should not be using them. But we're going to go through the next slide, eutrophication and bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is the build-up of toxins in a food chain. So if we start at the bottom of the food chain with our producers like phytoplankton, they might absorb a tiny amount of a toxin won't do them any impact and if you ate directly on these phytoplankton you wouldn't have too much of it wouldn't have too much impact on you but if we think about what's eaten those phytoplankton is zooplankton and they're not just going to eat one phytoplankton they're bigger organisms they need more energy they're going to eat three of them for example and so they have three times the amount of the toxin inside them so zooplankton, they're eaten by secondary consumers such as herring, as you see in that picture. And again, they're not going to eat one, they're going to eat multiples of the zooplankton. So then we have this increase again in the concentration of the toxin inside the organism. Herrings are going to be eaten by tuna fish and they're going to eat multiple of them. So then we've got an even higher concentration of the toxin inside the tuna fish now. And that tuna fish is going to be eaten maybe by humans or something like the killer whale. And by the time that quarter organism is consuming that tuna, it's going to be ingesting a high quantity of the toxin. And when we have a high enough dose of toxin, it can do us harm. Now, there's a very famous case, uh, I think one of the first cases to kind of highlight this issue, 
and we highlight by a disease called Minamata disease. And it's because in the Minamata Bay area, there was a company pumping waste into the local water supply. And this, water, this waste had mercury in it. Now, they recorded um, the amount of mercury inside different organisms in the local food chain. And they found that in the zooplankton, it was very low levels, wasn't a concern. But as they went up the food chain, they found that this quantity of mercury was getting higher and higher. And they managed to link this with humans who were eating fish, such as tuna and herring, who were getting ill in the local area. So these people, about 2,500 people, became really ill. They had suffered damage to their brain. They were left with speech, vision, hearing problems. They were left with permanent neurological damage. And so this went global and this kind of highlighted the need to kind of control the waste we put into our oceans. It's also one of the reasons because this build-up of heavy metals like mercury why pregnant women are advised not to have too many portions of tuna while they are pregnant. So real-world applications still happening today. Eutrophication. So we mentioned earlier, this is when we have the overuse of fertilisers. And then if we've got too much kind of on the surface and we have, say, heavy rainfall, that will cause runoff to st local streams, rivers, lakes. So what happens in the local area, you'll have a build up of things like nitrogen and phosphate, which are inside the fertilisers. And this stuff is perfect for plant life. And what we get is a build up of algae, and we call that an algae bloom. So you get so much um, algae being formed that we get this kind of layer on the top of ponds, and you sometimes see this out and about. Now, this algae is not going to live forever, it will eventually die and that will decompose in the water and that decomposition takes up a lot of the oxygen from the water and we find the water gets what we call anoxic without oxygen or really depleted and the impact of this will, is that it causes other plants and fish to die and it destroys the ecosystem. We're all aware of oil spills so the latest big one was in 2010, Deepwater Horizon, that was in the Gulf of Mexico, and we had 4.9 million barrels of oil washing up on the shores of Mexico and the US. So short term effect, and um, you'd have seen these images on the news, thousands of seabirds were killed, the oil gets in their feathers, they're no longer able to fly, and we get lots of fish being damaged too. Longer term, we are seeing mutation in the shrimp population up in North Bay. So we have landfills all around the world, all around the country to deal with our waste. And we get something in landfills called leachate, which is a toxic substance um, from the breakdown of rubbish in landfills. So leachate can release methane into the atmosphere, which contributes to global warming. Landfills also attract vermin, rats and seagulls. And we also have some of the plastic from landfills blown out to our oceans. And that can enter the food chain and kill animals high at the trophic level. So we've had lots of reports recently of microplastics being found in fish, but also we're warned quite often how turtles mistake our plastic carrier bags for jellyfish and eat them. Governments and individuals can recycle more rather than send stuff them to landfill to kind of help reduce this problem. So how do we judge if a water is healthy or not? So some of you may have done field trips in primary school or low down school where you may have done some pond dipping. And we can look for creatures which live in our waterways which indicate whether the water is clean, well oxygenated or whether it's poor quality, low oxygen levels. So a, re a good indicator of a healthy waterway is the mayfly nymph and the stonefly nymph on the left hand side of this video. And poor quality would be the rat tail maggot and some midge larvae there. So maybe pause the video if you want to have a look and have a read a bit more about some of these indicator species. But they are, if we see them there, they tell us something very immediate about the quality of the water. So hopefully you'll be able to give me some examples of herbicides and pesticides, etc. Tell me a source of them, where are they being used? and what effect they have on the environment. 
If you haven't managed to fill in your table yet, go back, spend a few moments re-listen to fill that information in. So a quick quiz to end us off, see what, how well you're listening. So five questions. How many people do not have access to clean water? What mutation was found in the shrimp after the deep water horizon disaster? Which gas does leachate release? Name two water by indicators that show very clean water. And what is the overgrowth of algae called? So let's go through these. How many people do not have access to clean water? A shocking 1.2 billion. What mutation was found in the shrimp after deep water horizon? We've seen that they are growing now with a loss of eyes. What gas does leachate release? Methane, a really potent greenhouse gas there. Two water by indicators that show very clean water. They are the mayfly nymph and the stonefly nymph. And what is this overgrowth of algae called? It's an algal bloom associated with eutrophication. Right, so does all water have to be potable? What were your thoughts on this? Does it all need to be safe to drink? Or is there some water which maybe has a different purpose that we're not so concerned about getting to drinking standard? Be interested to know your ideas.